With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. A relatively new sport, but one that British athletes, fans and TV viewers have been gripped by. Kicking someone in the head doesn't come much better when there's an Olympic gold medal up for grabs. I'm Michael. And I'm John, and the sport of taekwondo brings its own stunning stories, as well as the glory, the last gas losses and heartache. But how do you maintain the momentum and success? This is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy, the podcast speaking to the men and women behind the scenes of sport in the UK. Hi, I'm Paul Buxton. I'm CEO of GB Taekwondo, which is the Olympic and Paralympic performance arm of the sport. And Paul, you're approaching your first anniversary in the job as CEO of British Taekwondo. How would you sum up the first year in charge? Uh, I think it's been a really interesting year. I think incredibly difficult year for the team because, of course, normally the first year of of an Olympic cycle, uh, there's a little bit of time uh, to to reflect on what's happened in Tokyo and to to try and reform and reconfigure and re-energise for Paris. But the reality... Uh, for the team over this last year is they've had to jump straight back in um, and and try and gain ranking points in order to move towards qualification for Paris. So there's been no um, breathing space really for the team over the last year. So it's been an interesting time to to come in, uh, quite, quite challenging, quite a few changes, um, which probably look relatively minor on the surface, but for the team are quite significant in terms of rules. Uh, that the team have been trying to adapt to. So so kind of an interesting but quite uh, a tricky year to come in. But within all of that, there's been some real uh, positive um, performances, in particular for, from some of the upcoming athletes, uh, that makes me confident about uh, success in Paris. Do you think perhaps we underestimated the impact that that one-year delay on the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games had on the athletes? And then that has meant that organisations like yours have, have had those additional challenges that they've needed to meet in the year after the Games? It's interesting. I think we talked a lot about the preparation of the team for Tokyo and what it meant to the, the athletes that were going. I don't think we've probably talked enough about what it meant, not only to the team that are coming back, that are choosing to carry on and, uh, and go again in Paris, but also um, some of the younger athletes that that may not have had the same access to training during that lockdown period that, that our, our elite athletes had. And we certainly see uh, in the next generation of athletes some gaps in their development that, that are going to be quite hard to overcome. We actually think that's more likely to take to, to have an impact on what we do in the LA cycle rather than in the Paris cycle. So, so there's, there's a multitude of challenges, I think, really, you know, that the lack of ability for athletes to take a decent break um, after after Tokyo, are more experienced athletes, and then, as I say, sort of for the next generation, uh, there's 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 a different challenge, which is which is some of the other impacts of um, of that lockdown period, rather than necessarily when when Tokyo took took place. And you came in, Paul, as you say, after Tokyo, and obviously 
GB Taekwondo had some huge success there with uh, with medals and, and gold medals and more medals. And it's something that we've seen in London, well, built from Beijing, London, Rio, in, into Tokyo. But we also lost Latale Mohammed, who was who mm-hmm. was a well-known um, mm-hmm. uh, Taekwondo um, and, and, and was so successful watching uh, from Tokyo. But he's decided to retire. And of course, Jay Jones, who famously won those two gold medals in London and Rio, didn't quite have the success in Tokyo. How have you managed those two big names and, and the decisions that they've made? Obviously, Jade is, is carrying on. Yeah, I'm lucky, really. I've got a, a fantastic performance team. So I'm, I'm a step removed from the, uh, you know, the individual management of those athletes. But but yeah, I mean, it's great to see Jade uh, committing to go again in, in, in Paris. I think, uh, uh, you know, I think it'd be, it'd be amazing to see if she can, uh, if she can, a win again there. Uh, it's always sad to see um, ex- experienced and, and, and athletes that are great ambassadors for the sport like Latalo choosing to um, hit an end on their Olympic journey. Um, but, you know, that that is sport. We've got a new generation of athletes. And I think f- for me, I think it's really exciting to see who's coming through next with this, this sort of a, a long list of names, but there's definitely a short list who could uh, could surprise us over the next couple of years, I think. Um, and, and they're equally strong athletes, equally uh, good ambassadors for the sport. So it, it, it's, it's the nature of what we do when one generation moves on and, and, uh, and, and we have to move on with them and, and look, look at who's next. And I think maybe from a CEO's point of view, in, in some ways, having new blood coming through kind of makes you want to do something different. You said, you know, the challenges that you've had since since coming in and and even the athletes. But actually, this gives you opportunity to to maybe change a few things because you have different people that are coming through your team. Yeah, agreed. I mean, we, we see a different generation, really, and a different culture and different expectations from athletes than we did in the early days we've got to remember some of the athletes that are retiring now actually uh, started in the sport just as it was beginning to grow a program so they, they had experience almost pre um certainly pre uh, an established program lottery funded program um and yeah, you know, the, the next generation don't see that. They've come straight into those, those kind of programs. You know, that said, the journey that happens before they come, come to us, before they come into that national centre and that really well-supported uh, program is, is um, you know, it's, it's actually not changed much at all. And that's perhaps one of the biggest challenges I see ahead is, is trying to take some of the learnings and some of the progress that's been made uh, at the elite level and, uh, and and try and help athletes before they come to us get, get a, I would say better experience because that's to dismiss the, the really hard work that goes on in clubs around the country, but um, to, to improve the quality of their preparation so that they're ready um, for what they're going to experience when they become part of, of the national programme. Uh, we do some work in that space, but um, I, I definitely feel we, we haven't been able to reach far enough to make the difference that I'd, I'd really love to see us make. So, so yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's almost three groups of athletes. There's our established, established athletes that we're there to, to hopefully support, to go again. Um, there's, there's the upcomers that are already part of our Academy program, but then equally there's this next generation who I say have been affected perhaps more than most, uh, more than the rest of our athletes by this lockdown period. And, um, and equally by the need to strengthen that infrastructure of sport that underpins uh, what we do. And just talking about one of those experienced athletes who is going again, Jade, she joined the SAS. TV viewers will have seen her on Channel 4 recently. Does that terrify you that she's going to perhaps hurt herself jumping out of a helicopter? Or do you think this is fantastic exposure for my sport? Mm, good, good question. It probably terrifies our, our performance director and our medical team uh, more than more than me, who's perhaps got a slightly broader perspective um, on on thinking about the exposure of the sport. So uh, I think it's a great thing. Once we've got once athletes that are at a, a stage where it's reasonable that they they can take um, some time out after games. Although I say it was very difficult in this cycle with such a short three year cycle, but. Uh, 
Yeah, a bit of both. It's a great thing to see uh, um, athletes gaining a profile, uh, both for their own sakes, but also for the sake of the sport. Um, but yeah, it does carry its risks. Yes. OK, don't take offence at this next question, but I know what an athlete does. I know what a coach does. I think I know what a performance director does. What does a CEO do day to day? That's a really good question. I mean, actually, um, uh, it's it's probably one that's harder for me to answer the most because I, we we are not actually a national governing body. We're a we're a performance company, so uh, we have a quite tidy remit. Um, now that said, um, you know, of course, I I do know all colleagues in other national governing bodies and and, and what they get up to. Uh, the, there's there's a raft of things. I mean, I find. Uh, a normal working day can range from sort of firefighting <laughs> quite immediate issues to uh, trying to hold a line on uh, on a longer term strategy and build a longer term strategy with our board. So there's 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 a range of things. Um, and, and I think it depends so much on the sport and what it's focused on. I mean, for me, it's largely about supporting our performance team. It's about trying to uh, gain, uh, improve the exposure of the sport. It's actually a little bit about trying to help uh, what is an emerging national governing body gain some ground and, and start to build uh, the wider impact uh, of, the, of, of success on the sport. So the growth and development of the sport as a whole is not my priority, um, but I am lucky enough to be able to support uh, that emerging national governing body to do that because I think it's hugely important. So, so yeah, it's it's there's, there's probably not a normal week, um, but uh, there's certainly plenty to to keep us busy. And do you, Paul, review the performance director's performance? You, you yes. said you said earlier you, you you have that removed from the day to day management of the athletes, but obviously you as CEO, you're the one who's overseeing the overall performance. If that makes sense. That's, yeah, that's right. I mean, I think there's been some interesting discussions about what is the role of um, CEOs in, in, in governing bodies uh, when it comes to high performance programs. High performance programs have generally been led by performance directors who've, who've played a really strong leadership role. But it's almost like supporting a trapeze artist. They're always going to want to push to do something that's more and more challenging. Um, they're they're taking risks in their day-to-day -day work. They're, they're having to really, really push themselves to limits. Um, and inevitably, there will be occasions where people fall off that tightrope. And I think my job or, or the job of a CEO is firstly to make sure that the challenge that they're, that they're undertaking is reasonable and sensible. Uh, it's secondly to, to give them the support and confidence to, to go and do what is, is an incredibly difficult job. Um, and it's thirdly to make sure you're there to, to to catch people if they fall. And you mentioned that GB Taekwondo is is a new sport. You know, 2002, I think GB Taekwondo was established mm. as a as a as a as an organisation. Does that actually benefit you, Paul? That you don't have this whole heritage that that some sports that we've seen in in recent times and and spoken to CEOs here on on Great British Bosses that they have a lot of heritage that actually is hard work, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, it's interesting because whilst whilst the company is relatively new and therefore doesn't have that baggage, if we want to call it that, um, the, but the, there is certainly a strong, strong heritage in the sport that we that we um, you know we do bump into a lot. Um, and if I take a really practical example, we have athletes uh, coming into the high performance program from different forms of taekwondo you know there can be a huge perceived barrier um especially amongst those that have been in the sport a long time uh between those different forms of taekwondo because there, there can be a really sense the real sensitivity to um athletes joining an, a national program to participate in the olympic version of the sport who have grown up in a non-olympic version of the sport and but but um, you know, our job is to keep those pathways open. So there is, there is, you know, despite being a new organisation in that landscape and, and luckily sort of being a relatively politically neutral, if I can use that word, use a small p, politically neutral organisation. Um, you know, the, the, those, that heritage can from time to time work against us. Um, 
you know, that, that said, I think what we've been trying to do is embrace, embrace it as much as we can and, and, and sort of celebrate it uh, as well, you know, for, for, all, the, for all the challenges, there's, the, there's good things too. Yeah, for example, we can talk about uh, a belt system in, in, in Taekwondo. And, uh, you know, I know some of our coaches might get frustrated that what's being taught through that syllabus is not necessarily preparing athletes uh, brilliantly for uh, joining the National Academy. That said, um, as a system to motivate improvement in the sport, uh, it, you know, it's a great thing. It's just it's a question of how we embrace some of that heritage in a way that's helpful um, for uh, young aspiring athletes to, to work towards the national programme. And just to build on that and talking about Olympic taekwondo specifically, 1988 and 1992, to give a potted history of taekwondo and the Olympics, it was a demonstration sport. Finally, it became a full sport in Sydney in 2000. GB win their first medal in 2008. And then at the last Games, you have eight medal events, you come back with three medals. Does that show that with the right support, the right funding, the right leadership, the right structure, that actually within a couple of decades, we could take any sport, let's say basketball at the moment, and we could get them to the Olympic podium with the right support? That's a really good question. Um, uh, and, and not to mention, actually, in Tokyo, we also, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a first for uh, being part of the Paralympic programme and uh, two, two medals won there. That's the very first, um, first Paralympic Games that Taekwondo became a part of, which I, th- which I think sort of reinforces the, the question you're asking, which is, which is, I think if you do establish a system or figure out a way of doing high performance um then yes it can it can create sustained success and in many ways i think that's really what what uh, lottery not just lottery funding but the way lottery funding has been managed and distributed as has, has done it's enabled people to not just fund success when it happens but uh build systems that make the chances of success much higher um for for aspiring british athletes and i think that that's absolutely what I see. Um, I see as our responsibility, and uh, it, it's great to see how some of the method and the learnings from the Olympic environment can 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 be applied in the Paralympic environment very quickly and, and make that difference. Um, wh- wh- whether that can be done exactly the same in in other sports, I think is a really difficult question. I think we're probably quite lucky that as a relatively small sport. Um, any money coming in was transformational from the word go. Um, whereas I think, I think it's much harder to uh, make those transformational changes in, in sports where there is a very bigger established program and ways of working. Yeah, I've been to your performance centre in Manchester on numerous occasions. I just wonder whether every member of your team, when they walk in and they see a big picture of Sarah Stevenson, just kind of give her a little glance and, and thank her for what she did in Beijing and that bronze medal, which wasn't without drama, as we we recall, because that set a, a whole programme going. And I guess that's kind of what I was saying. Could we get a programme going for some of these non-traditional sports like volleyball, basketball, breaking, for example, which is now on the Olympic programme? Yeah, de- I mean, definitely. I actually think, um, you know, what, what what we start to see in, in, in breaking the, the major event recently up up in manchester um is is yeah I, I think i think you can definitely take the learnings of the last 20 years uh, plus um of work across olympic and paralympic sports and apply them to those sports and accelerate their development really quickly i mean i would normally say i think it takes eight years um to to build a system before that system is really having an impact on uh, uh, in, in the level of impact that we'd like to see a systematic impact on athletes whether we can do that quicker um, now, we know an awful lot more as a system is, is a good question. I think we can, but but equally there are sports, in particular the team sports, where the whole process of qualification takes a long time in its own right. So just just getting from the point of making a difference to athletes to them actually being on that stage uh, performing is it's 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 time consuming. It's got to be a sustained commitment um, to make those things happen. I think. We're talking to Paul Buxton, CEO of GP Taekwondo. This is Great British Bosses from Anything But Footy. Are you a fan of Taekwondo, Paul? 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, does it matter? Does it matter if the CEO is a Mm. fan or takes part? Do you, have you kicked anyone in the head? Uh, You know what? I'm not flexible enough to kick. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Good good question. I I think you do have to be a fan. You have to be a fan of sport and you have to be a fan of the sport that you, you, you commit to getting involved in. Uh, I was lucky enough in the really early days leading up to London um, to work with um, Gary Hall, the performance director and the team at, uh, at DB Taekwondo before, you know, in, in the days before Beijing, about 2006 to right through to 2012, um, as a, you know, from, from an investment side and, and, and just to help them establish the program. And I think just through that period, I, I became a, a big fan of what they were doing, a big fan of the sport and, uh, and all the characters that, that get involved in it. So, so whilst uh, I am certainly not capable uh, on the mat, um, I'm definitely passionate about the sport. Because you were talking to Michael about the system and setting up that system, and you worked at UK Sport, and that obviously provides advice and 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 guidance and and governance as well to organisations like yourself. Uh, yeah, and you know, actually, I, I was um, somebody asked me in the team about this the other day. Do I feel that Taekwondo runs through me uh, more than UK Sport after after you know nearly a year in post? And and I said, I think for me, it's always been both. Uh, and I say that because I think Taekwondo is one of the you know, the children of that world-class system. It's one of the sports that first received some serious recognition and, and, and money because we wanted to see success in, uh, in London. And it's one of the sports that took that opportunity, grabbed it with both hands and fundamentally changed the fortunes of a group of athletes in, in the sport. And that didn't happen in all sports, but I think it was one of the great success stories of, that, of, of the programme of work that, that UK Sport undertook um, you know, really starting seriously and strategically in sort of 2004 to So, so yeah, I, I, I don't sort of see the two uh, things as massively distinct. I actually think Taekwondo has probably been one of the, the good examples of, of, of what uh, UK Sport did. And it's, it's now nice to sort of work in that and try and help the sport find the next chapter in that, in that journey. And one thing I think we've learned more than anything over the last couple of years, Paul, is that elite sport has changed. It's not just about winning medals at the Olympics and Paralympics at all costs now. UK sport have this this medals and more strategy. And I guess that's Mm. potentially changed the role of a CEO and and the the team below you in the performance sector. Uh, I think it's it's changing. And I choose my words carefully because I think... I think at the moment, everybody's still in the process of trying to figure out exactly what that means. I think, I think most of us agree with the aspiration that, that if, if, um, if the nation's going to put serious investment into winning at the highest level and supporting athletes to win at the highest level, then they want, they want to see a broader impact of, of that success. And I think we all feel, those of us working, working in it, all feel that, that that's... Um, you know, that's certainly possible. There's certainly um, good things that come from the work that we do. Exactly how we uh, realize, how we improve that, how we realize that more is another question. And I think we, we certainly are still trying to work through exactly what we can do in that space. The, the things that I, th- I guess what we're trying to identify is the things that will come naturally to us rather than the things that are not necessarily directly connected to what we do and 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 by that I mean for example just in the last year we've agreed to support an athlete that uh, very sadly was taken out of Afghanistan as a refugee and we're we're supporting him here as a part of our program as a refugee it's one of those things that we think we can do that that, that helps and aligns really well with our um, you know our remit and and our day-to-day work so I think we've, we, we as an organisation, I think it's true across sport, have got a fair bit to do to really understand what, what medals and more means to us. And that's not necessarily all of us collectively, but each of us individually, what, what it means and what we can do to realise the positive effect of, of, of um, succeeding in sport. UK sport brings events to the country, helps bring events to the country. Last year, you in Manchester, you mentioned that with breaking earlier, but you stayed to the European Championships in Manchester for, for Taekwondo. You've got the World Grand Prix in Manchester coming up later this year as well. How important is it that we have these events in this country? And are we the world's best at putting them on? 
let's big ourselves up here. <laughs> I th- it's really interesting. Actually. I think both in terms of major events and in terms of uh, running high performance programs, I think we were, we were definitely um, the world's best. And I'd, I'd say we're still there, but it's getting harder <laughs> to stay there. Um, you know, we, we were one of the, probably one of the sports that uh, if you went around the world to other events, um, some of them, frankly, weren't brilliantly well run. Um, and I'm being kind in my words there. Um, and so, so actually one of the benefits of home events was actually uh, knowing that the thing was going to run uh, to the dates that had been set more, more than a month in advance. Um, and it's actually going to be run well. So, uh, but, but yes, it is getting hard to stay right at the top of hosting. Do I think it's important? Yeah, I absolutely think it's, it, it's really important. Interestingly, um, I think after, after the European Championships, I, I wrote a note to the team uh, my old colleagues back at UK Sport and said, you know, despite sitting close to the major events team for, for, for a number of years in that office, I probably hadn't really appreciated just quite how important uh, the running of major events was, not just uh, for our athletes and for performance and for our standing in the, in the world, but because of the opportunity it creates to, to engage our volunteers, to cement local partnerships, to inspire local kids to attract commercial interest to um you know build on our international relations and um and to capture the imagination of new followers you know all of those things are are triggered um by these major events so so for me keeping uh, a series of events in the calendar that that create those opportunities is 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 massively important and hopefully something we can continue to be uh, world world leading at and it may be too big a question, but you mentioned funding earlier and obviously the UK sports system and, and providing money to train athletes to win medals and, and inspire. Can that continue? Because it's been building since 2012 and the government, successive governments have carried on providing that money. But there's lots of question marks about where money's being spent in this country at the moment. Um, do you think sports will will hang on to what it's got? Could it? cut its cloth accordingly my overall feeling is that sport is good value for money if i look at not just the impact on 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 athletes and the aspiration that that creates across sport in the uk um but but i look internationally at how we're perceived so much of it's defined by real simple things and sport being one of the most prominent um i do remember going out to support the holding camp in rio and talking to um, some people involved in in sport and in in, in, uh, in actually in Belo Horizonte where the the holding camp was, and they said, "Oh, we just love how you Brits do things." And I said, well, what, "What do you mean?" And they said, "Well, you know, you just know how to run stuff." And I said, "Okay, well, what what you know? Where, why do you think that?" And um, and they said, "Well, you know, just our experience of of London 2012 and how the games were run." Um, so. So they take that experience of seeing how we do in sport or how we run events or how our athletes perform and they relate it to how the country is perceived as a whole. So I, th- I think for me, it's a, it's, it's a relatively small amount of money um, for the impact that it can have on the global perceptions of the UK and what that means to trade and all sorts of things. So, 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 for, so for that reason, I, I think it's good value for government. I, I also think we have an obligation to try and support the aspirations of young um, British athletes. And, uh, and I, I, I hope long may that continue. Uh, so I think there's a great case to still be made, um, although you know, we recognise that there are a huge number of other pools on, on public funding that, uh, that, that are going to make it a tough, a tough, uh, a tough argument. Let's look to the future. If we were to kind of predict what the GB Taekwondo team was going to look like in Brisbane in 2032 at the Olympics and the Paralympics, are those athletes maybe now kickboxing or watching MMA, UFC? Are those kind of pursuit sports that you can potentially recruit from? Uh, definitely. I mean, we're, we're always keen to keep, you know, whilst whilst working with World Taekwondo in, in, in its purest sense, um, to try and build its systems and networks of support for young athletes. We, we also want to keep the door as wide open as possible. Um, and uh, we, we see ourselves as, as a champion, not just for 
for Taekwondo, but for those that uh, that want to pursue uh, a combat sport and martial arts a, as a whole. So it's an interesting balance between, you know, most sports will probably work within within their traditional pathways and then provide some wider recruitment opportunities. For us, there's probably an equal weighting. <laughs> we want to work with those traditional pathways, but equally, you know, we want to keep the doors w- wide open and find the right ways of doing that. So, so yeah, I, I'd imagine quite a few of the athletes that uh, hopefully will be with us in, in, in Brisbane uh, may not have found the sport yet. And uh, that's probably a part of our job over the coming years. Bit of work, obviously, to do before Brisbane, Los Angeles. And John and I were at UK Sport, your uh, former stomping ground, relatively recently. And they described Paris 2024 as hurtling towards us. Does it feel like you're <laughs> hurtling towards another Olympics and Paralympics at that centre, that fantastic centre in Manchester? Uh, yeah, de- yeah, definitely. I, I think it's, it's finding now a lot of the international qualification systems for most sports, and certainly for ours, um require athletes to build ranking points and ranking positions in order to, to gain the best routes to qualification and you know that's already that's already started so um i think at the same time uh, you know probably the one that feels like it's hurtling towards me almost more than paris is is la um and i say that because i i think you know, it, it's it's very easy to focus on the here and now. We've got a strong group of athletes that are going to go uh, forward who've already been successful in Tokyo, as well as some interesting athletes on the cusp of that. Um, you know, LA, we're really talking about that next generation. And, and I don't think we can underestimate the urgency to to, to help them on that journey. That journey is, is you know, we're, we're not that far away from it. Um, and, and so that's the one that... Uh, I probably almost feel more pressure from uh, the, than Paris. Absolutely incredible, Paul. I think you're the first person to tell us that LA is not that far away. Uh, <laughs> we, can't, we can't absolutely wait uh, to see what you guys do in Paris and LA and Brisbane. Uh, thank you so much, Paul Buxton, CEO of GB Taekwondo, for talking to great British bosses. Thank you both for inviting me. Thank you. Sports Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.